to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding. I'll pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 15. We welcome you today to our study of worshiping God through our singing. What a great subject the idea of worship is. We have the privilege to bring God the honor and glory with our voices, by the singing that we do, and we can uplift and laud and magnify the beauty of our God. As always, we want to encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of free Bible study materials. We have all of our lessons available free for download. You can listen to the audio or watch the video, as well as if you'd like to have a copy of those, we'll be happy to send you a CD or a DVD free of charge. You can go onto our website and fill out our free media request form. We'll ship that to you in a couple of weeks. Or you can call us, email us, or write us at the information given during our program this morning. As we think about the subject of, of singing and the music that Christians use in our worship to serve God, this is indeed a very important subject. For as you read the Bible, it's one of the ways Christians together corporately worshiped Almighty God. And if we're going to worship God correctly today, we need to do it in the way that God has asked us to. As we think about the subject of singing, and as we think about the subject of, of music in our praise of God, let's begin by reminding ourselves that what we do in worship and how a Christian even lives his life must be governed by the authority of God. Don't we all agree that we need to do what God asks us to? And we need to listen to God and obey the voice of God to be pleasing to Him? Even Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so friend, as we think about the subject of worship and as we think about worshiping God in song, let's realize the Bible is our authority for worship as well. Do you remember John 4:24? Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him, here's the necessity, must worship in spirit and in truth. I've got to put my whole heart, soul, mind, and body into worshiping, but I also need to worship God in truth. God's Word is that truth, and so we want to worship God according to the Bible. And friend, as you think about examples, we want to illustrate the importance of doing this by showing some examples of people who didn't do it correctly to really emphasize and illustrate our need to follow the Bible in worship. Let me give you an example. There are two men in the Bible by the name of Nadab and Abihu. We read about them in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. These two priests did not do what God commanded, and they perished because of that. Let, let me read the story to you so that you can see what they did and, and the reason that they suffered like they did. Listen to Leviticus chapter 10, the words of verses 1 and 2 about Nadab and Abihu. Here's what the scripture says about these two young priests. The Bible says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, put incense on it, now watch this, and offered profane, some versions will say unauthorized fire before the Lord, here's the important thing, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Did they do something God didn't ask for? Sure. They did something unauthorized, which God had not commanded them. Well, was God okay with that? Did, did, did it matter to God? Their heart may have been right. Maybe they were doing what they felt was right, but it wasn't according to God. Well, was God okay with that? Friend, fire rained down from heaven. God was serious about it. Fire rained down from heaven 
and destroyed them. Why? Because they did that, which God did not command. Think about King Saul in 1 Samuel 15. King Saul gets tired of waiting for Samuel. He's not a priest, but he's tired of waiting for Samuel, and so he decides to take the authority of the priest upon himself and offer sacrifice. And God says, Behold, to obey is better to sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For your sin, he says, is as the sin of witchcraft and rebellion. Well, what did Saul do wrong? He did something he wasn't authorized to do. Friend, here's what we're illustrating today. What we do in our worship, in every aspect, including song, must be based on the authority of our God. Now, as you think about the New Testament, we need to realize it's our law and our authority today. Colossians 2.14, the Old Testament's been nailed to the cross. Ephesians 2.14 and 15, the handwriting of requirements, which Moses, God wrote with his own hand, and Moses took down to the people, the Ten Commandment law. That's not what we're living under today. We're dead to that law. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, today... We're living under the new covenant of Christ. Matthew 26, 28, which He established with His blood. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 14 through 17, it is the perfect law of liberty. James 1, verse 25. And so when we think about the church and Christians worshiping today, we're looking to the New Testament. Matthew through Revelation. How did Christians worship then? And friend, the New Testament clearly teaches that we're only to do that which is authorized. Let me illustrate it to you with several passages. In Matthew 28, verse number 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Then he said, You go make disciples of all nations. And he told them how to do that as well. But here's the important thing. Who has all authority? in heaven and on earth, in the church and in heaven. Jesus does. God has given Him all authority. If Jesus has all authority, how much does that leave for me and you? None. Christ is the head of the church. He has all authority and therefore we must follow His law and His teaching. In John chapter 2, verse 5, the mother of Jesus illustrated it this way to the servants at the wedding in Cana. She turned to those servants when she realized Jesus was going to perform the miracle. She turned to those servants and she said this, Whatever He says to you, do it. That's the mindset and the attitude. Colossians 3.17 Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of, which according to Acts 4 verse 7, means by the authority of. Whatever we do in word or deed, we're to do all in the name or by the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And friend, as you think about this idea, Revelation 22, 18 and 19 says, we're not to add to or take away. I can't put something in that I like. I can't take something out that I don't like. I've got to follow the Word of God. Do not add to His Word, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 6. And so we must only go by the Bible and do what the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, says. Well, with that in mind, let's ask this question. What does the New Testament say about singing and music for Christians today? Friend, I want to share with you every passage in the New Testament as it relates to our worship here on this earth as God's people. Matthew 26, verse number 30, the Bible says that Jesus and His disciples sang a hymn and they went out. They left the Mount of Olives. They sang a hymn. Acts 16, verse 25, Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners are listening to them. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, I will sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding. I'll pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding. And so Paul and the, taught the Christians there to sing as well. Listen to Romans chapter 15, verse number 9. The Bible says these words, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written, For this reason I will confess you to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. 
We are to teach one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart unto the Lord. Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 says that same thing. Uh, James 5 verse 13 says, Is any among you happy? Let him sing psalms. And then, of course, Hebrews chapter 2. Listen to verse number 12. The Bible says in verse number 12, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. Friend, as you study everything the New Testament says, singing is a very important part of Christian worship. It's one of the ways that we worship God in spirit and in truth. But friend, I hope you'll listen very carefully to this idea. In the New Testament, we do not find an example or authority for singing or music with mechanical instruments of music. Now let me say that again. In the New Testament, in the worship that you find that is our law today, in the examples of Christians, we don't find any mechanical instruments of music in worship. Remember, there's just not any authority for it in the New Testament. We're to do whatever we do in word or deed. We're to do by the authority of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.17 We're not to add to nor take away. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 It's just not found in the New Testament. And friend, when you think about this idea, what the Bible does teach a mechanical instrument of music cannot accomplish. Let me, let me illustrate it to you this way. Let me mention those two passages, premier passages again, about singing for the church. They're Ephesians 5 verse 19. Let's look at it first. Look at Ephesians 5 verse 19 and I want you to see what is commanded in music and in singing a mechanical instrument cannot accomplish. Speaking, here's what Christians are to do, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Can an, instrumental, can an instrument teach, admonish? Can it do those things? No, that, that's, not, that's not the idea. Uh, the other passage is Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. And I want you to notice what it also says on the subject of singing. Colossians 3, verse 16 says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Again, a mechanical instrument cannot do that. Now listen carefully. Does the Bible teach that we are to make melody? You bet it does. Where? We're to sing and to make melody in our heart unto the Lord. As a man thinks in his heart. What's the heart? The heart's not here. The heart's here. The heart is the thinking organism. Okay? My, 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 my spirit, my emotion, as well as my intellect. I am to sing and I am to make melody in my heart to the Lord. That's the way God has authorized us to worship Him through singing and through making melody in the heart that man has given. And friend, when you think about the fact that God doesn't anywhere in the New Testament mention mechanical instruments of music, we have to realize if God wanted that, He would have told us. Uh, Hebrews 7 verse 14, It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing. Why couldn't Jesus be a priest uh, of the Levitical order? Well, because He's from the tribe of Judah. Do you see the point that He's making though in Hebrews 7 14? Moses never said anything about anybody from Judah being a priest. What's that mean? Because Moses didn't say they could, meant that they couldn't. When Moses said only Levi, or when Moses said the Levites were to be priests, he didn't then have to go and name all 11 other tribes. When he said the Levites, that naturally excluded everybody else. When God has told us to sing 
and make melody in our heart and has said nothing about mechanical instruments or music, friend, we need to do what God says. Uh, let me illustrate it to you maybe this way. I, I think we can all understand that we need to go by what God says, and when He says something, that's kind of exclusive, right? Let me illustrate it this way. To show that we mean what we say and that we don't have to go back and then say you don't do this and don't do that, what God says is what He wants. Uh, let me illustrate it. Let's say that you're going to order pizza. Let's say you call up the local pizza place. Let's say you call up uh, Domino's and you say, I'd like a large pizza with pepperoni and black olives. Okay, be there in about 30 minutes. You wait about 30 minutes, doorbell rings, somebody shows up, they've got your large pizza, uh, they open it up and it's got black olives and it's got pepperoni, but it's also got pineapple and it's got ham on it. What would you say about that? Well, you look at the belly and you say, I said pepperoni and black olives. And what would you say if that fella, you said, well, why, is there, why is there pineapple and ham on it? What would you say if he said, you didn't tell us not to? Would he be correct? Well, of course not. Why not? Because when you said black olives and you said pepperoni, that excluded everything else. Friend, when God said sing and God said make melody in your heart, God then doesn't have to go back and say, don't pluck a guitar, don't beat on a drum, don't bang on bongos, don't play a flute, don't play a violin. When God said sing and make melody in your heart, naturally, that's what God wants. He doesn't then have to go back and condemn everything else. In fact, did you know that actually most religious people even some who started or have religious groups named after them, most in years past realized mechanical instruments were not approved by God. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia says this. The voice of Catholicism says, the first Christians were of too spiritual a fiber to substitute lifeless instruments or to use them to accompany the human voice. That's what the Catholic Encyclopedia says. Um, the Orthodox Church says this, the execution of the Byzantine Church by uh, music, by instruments, or even the accompaniment of sacred things by instruments was ruled out by the Eastern Fathers as being incompatible with the pure, solemn, spiritual character of the religion of Christ. That's Constantine Carvanos in the Byzantine Sacred of Music. Here are some others. John Calvin, who many believe uh, recognized as the founder of the Presbyterian Church, he said this in his commentary on the book of Psalms. Musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, the restoration of other shadows of the law, talking about the old law. The papists, therefore, that's the Catholic Church, the papists, therefore, have foolishly borrowed this as well as many other things from the Jews. Men who are fond of outward pomp may delight in that noise, but the simplicity which God recommends to us by the apostle is far more pleasing to him. Listen to what John Wesley, who many recognize as the founder of the Methodist Church, said. John Wesley said, I have no objection to instruments of music in our chapels, provided they are neither seen nor heard. Another Methodist commentator, Adam Clark, said this, Music is a science I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. This is the abuse of music, and I here register my protest against all such corruption in the worship of the author of Christianity. Martin Luther, founder by many believe as the Lutheran Church and the McClintock and Strong Encyclopedia said this, he called the organ the ensign or symbol of Baal. It was idol worship to him. Charles Spurgeon, famous Baptist preacher, said this, I would as soon attempt to pray to God with machinery as to sing to Him with machinery. He said it's as authorized to use uh, an instrument, a mechanical instrument, to pray as it is to sing. Well, of course, neither are authorized. And so, what do we mention all this for? Well, friend, we mention this to show that mechanical instruments of music are not authorized in the New Testament. Every passage you read about worshiping God here as the church tells us to sing, 
There's not one passage about mechanical, man-made instruments of music that are authorized. And therefore, we want to sing and make melody in the heart as God has told us to in the Scripture. Now, let's shift gears just a moment then and let's think about what if, if singing and if worshiping God, making melody in the heart is what God wants. Well, how can I improve my singing in such a way that it really brings God the glory and the honor that He deserves? Friend, I understand it, not everybody has that beautiful of a voice. Not everybody can sing as beautifully as others can. And so, the, the, although we may not all have that beautiful voice that we think of, that's not necessarily a requirement to worship God in song in such a way that glorifies Him. How do we do that? A well, friend, you worship God in our singing by participating. I've seen people, maybe you have as well, during the singing of hymns of praise to God, they just sit there. They don't participate. They don't do anything. They never open their songbook. They never open their mouth. Why not? Well, friend, singing, just like any other item, is not an option. Is it an optional matter? to live for Christ every day? Well, that's not optional. Is it an optional matter to try to remove sin from your life, to try to avoid? That's not an optional. It's something I've got to do. Is giving an option? No, it's a command. Is praying an option? That's something we ought to do. Well, friend, what I'm trying to get across is singing's not an optional matter. It's not if I sound, you know, if my music is pleasing, if I sing in such a way that everybody thinks it sounds good. That's not the idea. If I'm going to worship God in song, I have to sing. And I have to participate. Sing one to another. That in the New Testament language is reciprocal. I sing to you, you sing to me. It's not I sing to you and you sit there. That's, that's not the way it goes. It's a reciprocal thing by which we can teach and encourage and admonish one another. And if you're sitting there like the proverbial lump on the log doing no singing, then friend, you're not teaching, encouraging, and admonishing, and you're not worshiping God as God would want you to do. Secondly, as we think about improving our worship through song to really bring God the glory and the praise, then friend, to do that, we need to think about the words of the song. We need to meditate on them, and we need to engage our mind. Let me remind you again of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 15. Paul says, I will sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding. I will also pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding. When Paul says, I'll sing with the Spirit, that's, that's the Spirit of man. That's the emotion. That's, that's, me, that's, you know, that's our joy, our happiness, our thanksgiving. That's the spiritual side of it, our emotional side of it. But then he says, I'll also sing with the understanding. Not only do I need to have my spirit engaged, emotion, I need to do it from a whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, but I also need to sing with the understanding. That requires that I think about what I'm singing. I mean, whatever the song may be, love lifted me, uh, amazing grace. We think about the cross of Christ. We think about how beautiful heaven must be. It isn't enough just to mouth those words. I want to think about, man, that's right. Heaven's going to be more beautiful than I can imagine. And when I sing that song, not only is God praised, not only are others taught and admonished, I'm encouraged and uplifted because I've thought about those biblical truths and they've reminded me of how wonderful that is. Here's another item. Friend, if you want to improve your singing, sing as if you're teaching somebody. Sing as if this might be your opportunity to encourage and admonish somebody else. Let's say you've got a visitor come in. Let's say somebody's visiting and they hear our singing. They see the, the way that we do it with joy and passion. And, and they're listening to the words. You're, they don't, maybe they don't have their songbook open, but they're listening to the words you're saying. And you're singing things that are true to the Bible. They're being taught. They're being admonished by those words. Colossians 3.16, you're actually teaching them by doing so. And so what a wonderful idea that is. And of course, as we mentioned, our singing needs to always be in spirit. Uh, you, you can't sit there with a somber look and, and no emotion. I mean, I'm not saying you're jumping up and down. That's not the idea. But we ought to be excited. 
We ought to be passionate. We ought to have joy when we, when we you know, sing songs about the suffering of Christ. It, it ought to make us think about what Jesus suffered, what He went through, and there ought to be an emotion involved with that, not guided by emotion alone, but ought to sing with feeling and emotion as well. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. My human spirit must be involved in that also to bring God the glory and the honor that He deserves. And so the challenge for us today is to, here's what we challenge you to do. Open your New Testament, the law that we're under today, and you just get out your Bible and read every passage in the New Testament about worshiping God here on this earth. How are Christians to worship God on this side? What did the church do? What did Jesus do? What did the apostles do? What did God command others to do? And you'll find in every instance they sing. And then we encourage each of us to, to sing in such a way that it brings glory and honor to God. Just think about it. As you think about worship, just think about how much God has done for me and you. Think about the beautiful words of verses like this. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Look at how much God gave up so that we could have the hope of heaven. God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. All men includes me and you. He wants us to be saved. We're told to cast all our care upon Him. He cares for us. 1 Peter 5, 7. The God of heaven cares deeply for you so much so that He sent His Son to die a cruel death on a cruel cross so that we could have the hope of eternal life. Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a Christian? You might be thinking, well, what do I do to become a Christian? Here's what the Bible teaches. You have to hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Having heard that message, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Unless you believe that I am He, Jesus said, You'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. You must also turn from sin and turn to God. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. Having made the good confession, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Acts 8, 37. You must do what Peter said in Acts 2. Peter said in Acts 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Have you done those things? If not, we beg you today to do that. And may each of us really think about worshiping God in such a way that the product of our worship will be God is honored and praised by our life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.